Yo, this is Alup. You got a pretty big balls to watch Torian's YouTube videos. Before we can start the 13th CS Go Major, face it London in the UK, we need to finish off the minors and decide which teams will qualify. So the EU minor is obviously the most competitive minor. It's the one a lot of people look to because you often see legendary names battling it out with tier two, tier three squads, seeing who's actually going to be at what is now just the major. Because in the past, you got out of the minor top two teams that took you to the major qualifier. And that in itself was still a step. Obviously, we know teams like famously with squads like Renegades, Immortals. Some of these teams rarely, if ever, made it out of the major qualifier. That's now the major though. So just getting out of the minor has become even more imperative, even more important because you get to have that stick and you get to be at the major, even though you're in what used to be the major qualifier, the new challenger stage, as they call it. So... As usual, top two teams make it out and go to the major. I think this is a very, very competitive minor. It's one of the best I've ever seen in terms of top to bottom, like pretty solid parity between the teams. Now, I don't think there's very many strong teams here. There's no like favorite teams in the traditional sense, like a top 10 team, like what are they doing in there? Wow, they should easily make it out. Funnily enough, like over in the NA minor, you had NRG and they were supposed to be a shoe in to make the major. Obviously they did not. That was massively shocking. Over in EU, we've got a bunch of names you're going to recognize, a bunch of teams where they've been competing at different levels, but like the ones at the higher level haven't necessarily done that well. The ones at the lower level have done pretty well. Some complete unknowns. So it's really hard to know where they're going to mix match not a lot of parity in terms of like having played at the same tournaments against each other there's actually a very mixed bag but parity between the squads looks pretty good except for the kind of teams that you expect to do nothing now the format is one something i want to comment on a little bit it's a format we've used for a bunch of majors now in the minor format and I actually like this. It's where you have a GSL group. And while, yes, I would always rather GSL groups are best of three the whole way, the winner's matches only are the best of ones. So we're thinking of the format that famously used to happen at DreamHack tournaments, but has now been changed. I actually prefer that it got changed at some of the DreamHacks. I, I prefer, or at least at the Masters, where they do the best of three in the upper. It's best of ones in the winner's match. And then all the lowers match in the group are best of three. So the second team has to win a best of three to get out. But the good thing is, even if you fluke the best of ones and you get to the playoffs, whereas in a tournament that's just two GSL groups into a single limb, that's where the best of ones really mess the tournament up because you can go directly to the top four, but not actually be that good a team. Or you can go to top four and then the team that comes out second plays the first team from the other group and you get what should have been the final and the semifinals. Luckily, the playoff bracket is a double a limb best of three bracket. So first of all, the there's a very good chance top two teams can meet in the final. You obviously have a chance to even lose in the in the playoff bracket. And I think generally it's going to mean that the best team should still make it out of the group no matter what. Don't know if it, the two best teams will. But then in the playoff bracket, generally the top two teams should be the ones going to the major. So all in all, not a fan of the best of one part, but I think this is a good compromise. I think overall it helps make up for some of the weirdness that you get when you have a single limb bracket after two GSL groups, especially with best of ones, because it takes care of the wonky seeding due to the double limb nature. It also means you can play teams a bunch of times. You might play a team three times, which could be interesting in terms of the strategical format of this. You're not necessarily just going to get past someone once and they're not going to know your maps or how you play. You might have to play them two or three times in the tournament. In fact, very likely it seems to get to the end, obviously play each other twice. Now, as I referenced earlier, a very unique aspect to this tournament is when I was coming to break down the preview and I was doing it with my system where I have like, you know, the favorites for the tournament, contenders overall, like dark horses. Also, one of the problems I came through is... I don't think this is one of the only tournaments ever where I look at, and I don't think it's actually fair to say there is a favorite in the sense that most people think of a favorite. Now, what I mean by that, because obviously favorite's a relative term. Favorite just means you are the team most likely to win the land, to make it. Sure, in that sense, it means it. But I think when most people say favorite, they mean a team that's like coming in pretty strong. This is the team that you expect to win. Like you could put your money on this team. But the, the favorites in this sense are so marginal. And we're talking about such tiny little gaps. And then teams that like have done sort of okay to decently at tier one, but not very deep. But then the teams that have done pretty well at tier two, but haven't played at tier one. And then teams that haven't really done anything, but maybe have some players. So for me to pick an actual traditional favorite, 
doesn't make a lot of sense at the moment, especially because, like I say, if we're picking favourites, I don't think there's any team that's actually assured to get out of this minor. That's how competitive it is. That's how much map pool and matchup is going to matter. And then small individual differences could make a massive difference at this tournament because there are not very many good teams at this tournament, any that look like they're even going to be top 10 in the near future. So... What I'm going to do here is, whereas normally I have favourites, and if it's a big tournament, that'll be like Astralis and FaZe. Okay, yes, traditionally, whoever I name as my first one or two teams are the favourites for the tournament. But in the traditional bracket of favourites, like, yeah, bank on these teams to win or go deep. I don't think you can really say that at this one. So I'm actually going to say for now, I'm not going to put anyone as a favourite. But when I say the next teams in the contenders, they are the favourite in the traditional sense, just not in the sense of how I break these down. So the contenders I'm going to pick for this one are going to be two teams. I'm going to pick Optic Gaming, the Danish lineup, and I'm going to pick NIP, the Swedish lineup. So Optic Gaming. Since they went to the old Danish lineup, they've only had a few lands. They went to EPL Season 7. They only finished 7th to 8th there. They managed to beat NIP, the old squad. They beat Space Soldiers. Okay, okay team bearing on Tier 1, but hasn't done that much on LAN. They lost to SK Gaming in three maps. SK Gaming's not terrible. They're clearly top 10, but they're not very good. They're not necessarily going to win. So that wasn't too convincing. Then they went and did the DreamHack Open Tours. DreamHack Austin, this was really disappointing. They didn't even make the playoffs there. They lost the best of one to Rogue, Hiko and Ricky's team. They beat Complex. Oh, was Ricky in the team then? I'm not actually sure if he's in the team at that point in time. The, oh, no, I think he was. They beat Complex E20, so their old mate Stanislaw and Shazam. And they lost to Space Soldiers. So going back and forth to Space Soldiers. Okay, it's three maps. Yeah, not really that convincing, right? They were, Optic was supposed to be a clear favourite to win that tournament outright. Now, there is the contingency that Space Soldiers and Rogue did end up playing in the final, played a pretty close final. So the two teams that eliminated in your group were the number one and number two team placing teams at the tournament. But I don't think that you can use that as an excuse if you're Optic. Because you've got too much talent in your team, too much potential such big names, there's no excuse to go out in the group here, even if he did lose to number one and number two. But the results have sort of gradually ebbed up because at DreamHack Summer, their last big tournament, they finished second. They were in position to potentially win the tournament. They beat Gambit in a best of one. They beat Complexity in a best of one. They beat North in a best of three. And North is no joke. Like, yes, they're not a top team. They're not super threatening. And until they removed Mertz, they had clear big flaws in terms of firepower and CT sides. But still, getting a, a w series win over them is no joke. They've got a good in-game leader, solid map pool. They know how to grind, how to play, how to use some of that experience to beat the lesser teams. So that was a pretty legit result. They lost to Imperial in the final, but that was seems like a one-off to me. Imperial's a very up-and-down team. Obviously, Esperanto had a pretty fabulous tournament, but then you hear this story that he like, wasn't even listening to the in-game leader, Crystal, was doing whatever the fuck he wanted, so don't really know where to put that. That feels like kind of bird strike, like, you know, one team just came out of nowhere. You couldn't expect it. They blew up your engine. What's going on? Yes, certainly the Optic players didn't have as big a performance as they should have in that final. They should have won this tournament if they were going to be this top team you expect from the names, but they didn't. So I'm kind of a bit conflicted on this team because clearly they do have talent they have potential they can have really good maps but they're not a top team they're not even really looking at the moment like if you had a race between them and north i'd pick north to go further overall in terms of the top tournaments and top rankings etc so at the moment i think they're they're not really making good use of their talent because you look at them first and foremost they have config Last year, this guy was one of the best players in the world, a top 10 player for 2017 in my book. At one point in time, you get to the autumn, the best Danish player. In this team, he's the star player. He is still the best player, but he doesn't look at that North level from last year. I don't know if it's the system, if it's not playing with MSL, who he partnered with pretty well and seemed to know how to highlight him in the, in the offense. I'm not sure what it is about playing in the snappy team, but he's been good and he's had some really good maps, but he hasn't had the superstar performance. At this level, some of these tier two tournaments, I expect him to be body in the fucking whole tournament, win an MVP, whether his team win the tournament or not. And he's been good, but not quite at that level. And that's a bit of a concern because as you're going to see when we talk about this squad, they don't have all that much in terms of the support of elements and they haven't really been this fabulous tactical team that you think of a snappy team and you think if you just give him star players, he'll do a lot. Yeah, but does he have the other part of the structure? Because for me, support of elements is what allows allows tactical teams to implement that because you need people who are helping out, facilitating, setting up the stars, doing all the little pieces that connect what the in-game leader's vision is, the setup, to then being able to execute a tactic. They look like more like a skill-based team at the moment, who, if anything, should be playing a loose style. And if they're doing that, they're not actually quite living up to the skill-based end of it. So Yogi, I think, has been good. But I still feel like he hasn't made that next step up to become a truly international star. Again, he should be dunking on all these tier two tournaments. He's been good, but he hasn't been far away better than the others. He hasn't been necessarily better than like Esperanto was at that DreamHack summer. So for me, 
I actually see him as like the mini device at the moment because he gets his kills, he plays with the orb, he does somewhat passive at times. I know at times people enjoy the idea that he's going to be aggressive. I don't necessarily know that he's lived up to that. You see his deaths are very low because, like I say, for me, he plays more of a mini device style. You play around, you know where you're supposed to sit, you know what you're supposed to do in this round. You get your kills, you back off when you don't, you save the orb. You get into scenarios where you're not risking it, you're not playing super aggro. I think that's the right style probably for this squad. They've got a pretty solid team, but then it's going to need better tactics and you're going to need Confrey to go super ham because he's going to carry more of the load. He's almost like a lone striker in this team because Yugi, for me, if you want to use the analogy, is more like a really talented winger who isn't necessarily going to be your goal scorer. So the problem for for me is config and yugi aren't the superstar combo that you need to even dominate tier two and the problem then is you don't end up making use of the fact you have Cajun B on your team. Because Cajun B, when he played at Tier 2, was a fabulous player. He's a very solid veteran, all-around talent, plays his spots well, knows what he's doing in the game, reasonably clutch player, actually. Nice average performance. So if he's going to be solid like that, well, history has shown us if you have two young stars, that is the combo to have your three-player trio who can have really nice games, but you've got a really solid third. He can make up for one of them having a game off. Now, that's worked fabulously with Device and Dupree in, in Dignitas TSM. That worked pretty well when you had Magus and Config going off. This is why it's on Yugi, it's on Config, and the team to figure that out, because Cajun B's there. He's, he's a piece you can just pencil in, you know what he's going to do. He's been very solid. Gade is still the question mark. No one knows how he's going to fit in this team. He doesn't necessarily seem to me to have the mentality or the game for the kind of role they want him to play. I would say he should be in a lesser team. Maybe he should be on Fragsters and trying to be a star player there. That would be more logical to me. But okay... They've put him on this team. I think he's been somewhat underwhelming. Online, he's been all right. Offline, I think he still, still hasn't found his identity or maybe just doesn't fit the team balance overall. Snappy is the in-game leader. As an individual player, is a bot. Like, I don't know why people go so ham on, like, MSL, and then they say, like, all right, recruit Snappy. Like, hey, you are your fucking mind. He's just as much of a bot, if anything. Now then... A problem I see in this team is he's got all this talent now. Yes, he maybe doesn't have the supportive elements, but that's what's worrying to me is this is a team where... They kind of win in close fashion, even against Tier 2 sometimes. The map pool doesn't look strong enough, even against Tier 2, to be really wide and isn't particularly deep, although they have a couple they can certainly play on. So I have my question marks about this team, but the talent is clearly there. And they've had up and down results enough, and if you look at the opponents, that they should be a good, strong team at this tournament. So their map pool is somewhat interesting, because what I like is they're a team that will pick Nuke, so that makes them dangerous against many different squads. You have to at least... Uh, respect that in the pick ban veto. Then they can play some Mirage. They're in there with a bit of Train. Now, Train has always been a problem, child of Snappies. So I, when I've seen what happens at Tier 2, I'm not that confident when you go against Tier 1, but who the fuck's Tier 1 at this tournament, right? Inferno is a map they've played a lot, but has betrayed them a lot. That's worrying because everyone else plays Inferno. Everyone else in this tournament, well, not literally everyone, but most of the teams you're probably going to have to play to get out of this are going to play Inferno, maybe even pick Inferno against you. So that's going to be an issue if you want to win any Series 2-0 and therefore have a confident chance to make it out. That's a limiting factor. Beyond that, they don't have anything. Like, they don't really play Dust 2 Overpass. If they do, barely ever. I mean, are they going to win on it? Uh, questionable. You would think, in theory, Overpass should be playable. When you look at the players here who've all played that map, when you look at Snappy, he's obviously often called on that map. It's been a specialty. So maybe he can work that in, and that can be what solidifies the team. But okay, they've got the talent in this team. Results are all right. That might be enough to get out of this minor. That's the sort of teams he's talking about. The other team is NIP. Now, Ninjas in Pajamas... Obviously, since they made this move to get Lecro and let Draken go, they've only had two lands. They went to the CSGO Asia Championships, the one that Na'Vi won. They only finished 5th to 6th because they lost to... Let me think. Who did they lose to? They lost to Na'Vi. It, they got a map off them, though, to be fair. They lost... They beat, like, VG Flash or whoever the fuck that is. And they lost in three maps in the playoffs to Tai Lu, who had a stand-in. So losing to a team with a stand-in who's Chinese, not that impressive. But then again, winning a map on Na'Vi, that's pretty legit. Then you go and look at the fact that they went to ESL 1 Cologne and went out in last place because they lost to Ents in a best of three. Okay, sure, not a team you expect it to be very good, but they did dominate at NIP. NIP was very weak. I think they got 11 rounds over three maps. That is appalling. So you know what? You might think to yourself, how can you pick this team to be one of the teams that essentially is a favourite? I mean, you're saying contender, but you know, in terms of like top two team to get out, that's because 
we're not we're making a very cl- a small distinction between this group of players and the dark horses. It's very very narrow, but it's unfair to just put like five teams in one group. I think you've got to try and differentiate. So I'm going to do that. The main reason why I'm saying this team has its shot. Oh, by the way, the other map, uh, uh, Cologne was obviously the best to one loss to Cloud Nine, and themselves a bit of a train wreck. So terrible tournament. Now, first and foremost, just look at them before this recent move they made. They have some good players. They have some players. You look at what they've done over the last few years. You say, this should be a solid team. This should have some firepower. But most of them have been weaker in this team than they have been in those past teams. The only one who's looking anything like a star has been Forrest. He's been pretty good. He's actually had a decent performance, even on you're talking about a tier one level. Certainly not a superstar. Dennis has been decent for an in-game leader. But then again, as an in-game leader, is he doing that good a job? Very questionable. Rez, I think, has been underwhelming for basically the whole year. Lecro has had some real issues since he came to this team, but was good in Fnatic. Get Right has been very poor the whole time. Now, the real problem here is, in terms of raw firepower, a tournament like this, they should have shot. They should have a puncher's chance against anyone and on any and on most uh, in most series, although not on every map, which is a key problem. But the big issue here is that they've apparently made Lecro their in-game leader, as someone said on Twitter. Someone from Daily.esports, I think it was. Which I have to say, first of all, that could give them more firepower by opening up Dennis. I like that part. But, oh, God. Is Lecro an in-game leader? I don't know if he's ever done it in his career. I don't think necessarily Dennis was embracing it. But they seriously lack an in-game leader here. If I, I think the first thing they should do is be thinking about cutting one of Rez, Lecro, and Get Right and get an in-game leader. If you do that and Forrest and Dennis are really going to be star players, you might start to formulate a team that could do something. So the thing with Nip is they've just got some nice experience, some decent players. And I think in a field like this, they can play up to that. And there's enough flaws in the other teams or lack of experience that that should be enough. Their style, when they didn't have Lecro as the in-game leader, looked pretty weak, to be fair. They didn't have enough skill in the actual game manifesting to go for a brute force, just loose style. They clearly didn't have the right team balance and roles to be able to play any kind of nuanced tactical style. So they just looked like a fairly one-dimensional team. And then you looked at their map pool, well, it bore out in that, didn't it? I think your personnel and your style bear out in which maps you end up being good on because they could play a bit of overpass because it's been a map that they've been basically maining for like a fucking year or something. They could play a bit of Mirage if forced to. Obviously not traditionally a map that they play, but you can play fairly loose. They play some Nuke just because some of them are comfortable on it and not that many teams like to play. It's often like a forced punish Joker pick and they might be able to play Cash again against what level a team. So the map pool is very, very slim here. But there are decent players, and if you had to put your money on it, you say they probably would be one of the teams that would make it out, but they're touch and go. So when we go to the Dark Horse teams now, these are all teams who can make it out. There's two of them in here. They could all make it out over the teams above the ones I've mentioned. It's just that they have less factors going for them than those teams as flawed as those teams are. So the two teams here are left out, the former Envious squad, the mix that went to CSGO Asia Championships, and Ents, the Finnish team that shocked everyone with their performance at ESL and Clone, including eliminating NIP. So left out were the team that was the mix of MV players that went to CSGO Asia Championships, basically Happy and RPK were out of the team. Happy basically got like coup de and was ousted and then RPK didn't want to go. So they took in, they obviously had uh, Sixer, the old Envious player they brought back, wasn't very good. They got Envious and XMS back in the squad and they'd already had Haji in the squad formerly for, of their academy team towards the end of the Happy era. So they managed to finish top four at the CSGO Asia Championship. And I actually have to say, when you look at what happened, they lost the best of three to Na'Vi, pretty close fashion. Obviously, Na'Vi won the tournament, one of the best teams in the world. They beat VG Flash, expected, not that great a team. They beat Heroic in three maps. Okay, not that great to go to three maps, but you are a mix. It's a brand new in-game leader with Kiyoshima at this tournament. And then they lost to Na'Vi in the semifinals, 2-0. And they had a little, some moments that looked pretty decent in that series. When you look at who they beat, who they played, and the format, the format was weird at this tournament, because even though it was GSL groups, you didn't have the decider match. So what it meant was, whoever was in the winner's match, the loser just went straight to the playoffs. They didn't have to then go down and play the winner of the lower bracket of a GSL group to see who even gets out. So because Envious, obviously left out of this tournament, was drawn against Na'Vi, they were going to be going into the playoffs in the 56 one anyway. And actually, because they were in the same group as Na'Vi, I mean, they end up having to play Na'Vi in the semis. Whereas I think if you look at it, NIP came out second out of that group for losing in the winner's match because they played Flash first. I think actually, Envious was a better team than Nip. I think if they'd have had a different bracket, they might have actually been the team in the final with Na'Vi. I can't say definitely because VP played a decent tournament. Ty Lu was dangerous at times. I think it was very wide open who could have come second at this tournament because Na'Vi was the clear best team. <coughs> 
But that was shocking because they had this pog nature. Problem with that, obviously, is how much of that's going to carry over to this tournament? How much of individual performance is going to carry you? How much of the weird roles of just... I mean, they actually have roles that fit, but... In terms of like, this isn't a squad that will be chosen to put together. They're playing together out of happenstance. So it's going to go a lot on individual skill with this team. Scream was totally unleashed when he played at CAC. He looked epic, actually. He looked really strong. Back to the like headshot machine you expect him to be. Kiyoshima, who was the in-game leader, had a really nice all-around game. Pretty strong fragging himself on some maps. Haji, the guy they brought up from the academy squad, actually looked comfortable. Seemed to be doing his job on the T side. Seemed to be pretty solid as an entry guy. Sixer was pretty poor, but... He's the opera on the team. I don't think he did a very good job myself. Although overall, he's pretty weak, but they need a player. At least he has experience. At least he knows some of them. XMS, I thought, was pretty weak. He's never really worked in these envious squads. I'm not really sure what he was supposed to be doing in this one. I think he's making up the numbers. So they're obviously going to live and die massively on what Scream and Keo can do. Because if Scream and Keo can frag at a good level, obviously Scream can class frag at a world-class level, you've got a big advantage, actually, over a bunch of these teams in terms of raw firepower. Then again, if they're not going to frag that well, the roles don't really work that well on the team. The overall strength of the team's not that good and you haven't played many lands it's, it's kind of a last gap effort right so the map pool is where it comes down to for this team because their inferno looked legit keo seemed like he had kind of a feel for how to call on the t side of that map they looked pretty solid scream was looking very very comfortable they were able to play train but that was largely i think actually due to the raw fragging cash was in the mix somehow and they actually amazingly when forced to could play a bit of mirage obviously classically not an envious map so i think that that gives them actually fairly solid matchup if they play against optic i think if they play against nip nip actually might be one of the few teams that, ha that has a map pool where they can do some damage to the left out squad but then again left out have their own maps that they could probably flex against nip and make nip look weak so actually i think in terms of matchup in terms of raw firepower left out's got an outside chance to do it i can't put them in that favorite slash contenders group because they've only played one lan it was people just individually fragging out which you can't guarantee and you know this team's a bit of a mess it's not a real team is it the other team is ents now, obviously, they finished top eight at ESL One Clone, which everyone remembers. They had to play Astralis at the best of one, so no shame losing that. They beat NIP 2-0 massively. They beat Mouse Sports in very close fashion 2-0. They lost to Na'Vi, but they got a map off them, and they could have won that series 2-0. It was very close. So, okay, you look at that. Having close series when you're a young team means you probably should bank that. You'll also have close series you'll lose, or it took everything to get past those teams, so don't go too crazy with the results. But okay, some positive signs here, especially playing against some veteran squads in Nip, Mouse, and Na'Vi. Look at the squad. Sergey is the young phenom. He's like 16 years old or something. He's the one who carried against Mouse. He's the one who has the best numbers overall. Pretty crazy numbers, actually, for Cologne. He hasn't played that many lands, though, and especially not at Tier 1, therefore... I don't know yet whether I can expect that to happen at this land. Essentially, if he can go ham at this land against lesser opposition, now we'll start to know how legit he is. And so definitely keep your eye on him, but they're going to need that if they're going to be a top team here. Alu, obviously, is a strong vet. If Alu doesn't even have to be your best player, you're going to be a solid team. He carried the series versus Mouse. Uh, no, Na'Vi, rather. Uh, actually, what am I thinking of there? I think it was I think it was Na'Vi, right? Yes, I think he was the one that went crazy on Dust 2. Uh... Cool under pressure, massively good thing for a team that lacks experience, always has reliable numbers, plays his spot in similar fashion. I think he's a big positive for this team, but they also need more firepower because ideally he should be like the Cajun B of your team. Instead, it's him and Sergey really. So my big issue here is I want to see what's going to happen in terms of raw firepower from the others because like X7 Aerial didn't impress me. Alexi B looks decent, but apparently he's like the in-game leader or something. So I don't know really where the firepower comes from in this team obviously they lack experience so they're going to rely a lot on sergey and alex have to be very good in terms of maps inferno was their pick it was looking pretty good a lot of teams play inferno here some teams actually can't even seemingly play inferno like optic that's a good sign they can play some mirage dust too maybe a bit of train they let Nuke come in as the map against Astralis and the best of one, and there's a decide against Navi, so presumably they practice it. So actually, the map pool, they seem to have a decently wide map pool. They have some comfort on it. A couple of maps they have strength on, like Inferno. So I feel like that gives them a decent matchup against a team like Inlet Thout. If they had to play against Optic, they might be able to get something cheeky going there, get a map. So a team certainly to watch, but there's some flaws that definitely you have to consider. The also-rans are going to be Red Reserve and Kingwin. So Red Reserve went to DreamHack Summer, where they finished last place, pretty poor. They lost to AGO. 
close match. They lost a three-map series to North. So not as bad a tournament as the placing looks when you consider the squads. But still, last place, pretty terrible. They lost their coach because they let him go. Nasu, who, as far as I could tell from the outside, was doing a good job. Did a good job getting Penta to the major last year. He had Godsent this year, which is obviously what the squad was before. Almost made the playoffs at Star Ladder. So I thought that was pretty solid. They chose to go away from that, though. So I'm wondering if that's going to hamper the team. The players in the team have been very weird because on the one hand, the clear talent of the team is Brolan, the young phenom, another 16-year-old player, a guy who's been putting up good numbers on land, seems to be the true potential to grow in the team and make the team better and one day play for a nip or a fanatic. But then the other guy who's actually been performing, despite the other names, is Hampus. And he's the guy from the other Red Reserve squad in the past, who I don't know that much about as a player because I've only seen him play the odd match at like Tier 2, Tier 3 tournaments. Hasn't really been a Tier 1 player. So I want to see what he's going to do even against this opposition. This is kind of the opposition he used to play against. But what's he going to do when he gets to more Tier 1 lands? Because if he's your, some of your best numbers, that shows actually a bit underwhelming firepower considering the names. Because who else is in the team? Disco Doppelin and Twist. Disco Doppelin has been underwhelming, quite frankly, the whole time ever since he wasn't on Fnatic. I feel like he's been lost at sea completely. Twist still has talent. He'll show you it in games, but he's not a, a, a top talent. He doesn't seem like he has a lot of drive or like he's a big game player. And even sometimes against tier two, he can disappear. That's a bit underwhelming. Kind of shows you this team got a decent bunch of names and some talent, young talents, some older players who aren't necessarily at the right level. And then your in-game leader is the, the guy who got kind of left behind at Epsilon. Freddie B, who seems to be doing a decent enough job, seems to have done a decent enough job in all the teams I've seen him in, but he's not a big talent, he's not a big fragger, it's just somebody who's going to play more of the support of end of the equation. So the problem here for me is the pure firepower, and then the fact that you've got a bunch of players who probably should be a star on a team, and a couple of them are playing well, a couple of them aren't, so they're kind of a bit of a, a, a bit of nothing on this team. And the fact that they, they've lost their coach and changed him, I don't know if that's going to be a positive or if it's actually going to hamper them. You look at them as a squad, what are they going to play? Overpass, Mirage, Train. So, okay, a bit of an interesting map pool coming in this tournament. That's quite a unique one. That could give them nice matchups. But we haven't really seen enough from them as a team overall to say they can be a favourite to get out. This is very much, I think, going to go on individual ability at the tournament. And then, obviously, those matchups could be interesting in terms of map pool. The other also ran team, so I don't expect them to get out, but I'm going to put them here, is the Kingwin team. Now, they went to a LAN in Poland called Good Game League, where they finished 5th to 8th. That is a fucking joke. They got 2-0 by XCOM, fellow Poles, the players you won't know from Poland, and Fragsters, that improving Danish team, which on the Tier 2 circuit, like the DreamHack Opens, has actually been improving tournament on tournament, it seems like. Then they went to the Zotac European LAN, and they were able to win this LAN. They beat... Uh, Windstrike, who were the former Quentin Bellator fire team. They lost to Valiance, that team with Hunter, Nico's brother in it. That was also best of one. They then 2 0 NTC, who obviously have big names, but haven't been a very good team. They won in a three-map series against Imperial. Pretty legit, the team that won Dreamhack Summer. But then again, they have their own issues is when they had Crystal in the team. So according to Esperanto, not the good version of the team. And then they beat uh, Windigo in the final, who are the old, some of them are the, the Bulgarian players, the old G-play guys, if you remember from 2015. So a really bad LAN. And then actually a pretty solid LAN against some decent opposition that we know from Tier 2. So you look at the players, right? What's weird about this team is their trio of fraggers has been Rallen, Long-time player in the Tier 2 end of the scene and from Poland. Reitz, who's more of a newer player. And Minis, again, long-time Tier 2 player. A player who stood in for Virtus Pro. A player that people often thought, like me, who would be the player who got his chance in Virtus Pro, but never did beyond standing. So they've been the trio of, of top players, which in itself shows that the firepower is not, as, not actually as... You can't push aside the firepower of the team. It's not terrible, actually. But... If they're your stars, okay, I could understand Minis being your top player. Rallon, he's supposed to be more about the middle. Reitz, I'm not that familiar with, but a few games I've seen looked actually half decent. The real disappointment about this team is when you look at the lineup on paper, they've got a guy called Mouse. Now, he's supposed to be like Minis, a talent that could have been in Virtus Pro, one of the best players. Someone for the last couple of years has been one of the better players in Poland. He's been pretty underwhelming in this team, actually. He doesn't seem like he's found his spot or his role or his game's just dropped off entirely. That's a worrying sign because if they had him at a good level, then I'd say, actually, this team would have some of the better firepower in this tournament. Finally, you've got Taz, obviously the ultimate veteran, legendary player, good in-game leader. I'm hoping as an in-game leader, he can continue to play these teams. I hadn't played many lands. Harness them further as an in-game leader at this level, obviously absolutely fine. Then they've got Lord as their coach. He's been coach of many of these teams at Tier 2, the Polish teams in Poland over the last few years. I don't really know how much he's done for them. Hard to speculate, so I won't. The one thing I am sad about with this squad is that of the players they end up picking, 
Sparrow ended up going inactive and not being a player in the lineup. That's sad to me because I actually thought he was also a really big talent. Like if I had to pick the talents of this team, I was kind of past Manis a little bit. I thought he failed his chances. I hoped it was going to be the Sparrows and Mouses of the world that got to a good level and made a good squad and then had someone like Ataz utilize them as star players. But for whatever reason, he's not there. The map pool for this team is interesting. That's definitely where I want to see them play because they're a team that seems like they're willing to do bold picks depending on what the opponent wants. So they're playing Nuke. They're playing Dust 2. These maps where people ban Nuke a lot, almost no one's embraced Dust 2, except like the G2s of the world. They play some Train. So that's a very interesting map pool to go into any of these teams here. They can do some Mirage and Overpass, you'd assume, especially thinking of Taz and his history. So actually might have a surprisingly wide map pool. Not half bad map firepower. Having Nuke, except for like the optics of the world, you know, there's a plenty of teams here you could see me play against. Ents probably plays it, but the rest of the teams probably don't want to. You might be able to force a ban out of that. You've got Dust 2 there, that can be a Joker pick. Having Train, a bunch of the teams will play it, they're not going to ban it, but are they that good on it? The map pool is a little bit ominous here for some of the other squads. With that said, I would guess they don't get out of this major. The last two teams, and these are the teams in my bracket, no chance. They're not going to do anything. They're not going to get out of the mine, as far as I'm concerned, are going to be 3D Max and Sprout. 3D Max, bunch of French players from Tier 2, actually more like Tier 3, if I'm being fair. Some of them Envious Academy players. Some of them you've never even seen or played in, seen play at any big LAN, anything notable whatsoever. So I can't expect anything from this squad, actually. Then you look at Sprout. Okay, they've got Dennis, they've got Spitty, they've got some people you might know, like Nato Safix, who used to be a commentator. They've got three Danes, two Germans. Dennis and Spitty, massively known quantity, even at Tier 2 and Tier 3 lands. I haven't been that particularly impressive, to be honest. P fairly pedestrian numbers. This team went to a LAN PMU Challenge and finished second place, losing a best of three final to LDLC long after existence had left and a squad that you probably wouldn't, re wouldn't respect if you saw the players or expect to do anything. So that's pretty bad. Then you look at the fact they're not actually a young team. They're not a, some of them are inexperienced, but they're not like, oh, full of young talents who are burgeoning. No, it's not like the Imperial or one of these squads or Fraxus or something. This is actually kind of a whack squad. Like, I think where they're at, Tier 2, Tier 3, bordering on Tier 2, is probably where they deserve to be. So I don't look at this squad and see any reason why they would do anything or they would get out at this point in time. So I think there's some parity in the top four, maybe five to six teams. The bottom ones are pretty bad. There's no clear big favourites. So let's look at the groups, because that's what's going to decide a lot of this, right? Group A is Optic, Ents, Left Out, and 3D Max. The two teams I'll pick to get out here is I'm going to say Optic do it. I think they've just got enough quality, half-decent map pool. I even think these opponents generally are all right matchup. Then you look at the other squads. If they can get to the playoffs, and then you have to lose two best of threes, are they going to against these teams? I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that they overall make it out. So I think if they get out of this group, I know for the other one, it's going to be between Ents and Left Out. People want to believe in Ents, but I'm going to say Left Out does it, actually. I believe more in Scream and Keo being able to frag, and Keo actually looked like he had his head on his shoulders as an IGL. So I think that they've got enough in that squad, and Ents isn't that crazy in Firepower, certainly doesn't have experience. That I'm going to say Ents actually underwhelms and left outs the other team to get out. Though I do think the left out Ents direct matchup could be pretty fun because the map pool actually is somewhat overlapping. I think that could be quite fun. And actually left out, if anything, might have a, uh, some holes in their map pool maybe Ents can exploit. In group B, we've got Kingwin, Nip, Red Reserve and Sprout. Pretty weak group all in all. I mean, NIP, I guess I've picked to get out overall of the minor. So yeah, they're the clear favorite here. For the second one, I actually think this one's right wide open. I mean, Red Reserve and Kingwin, I also said are like also runs. Sprout, I think, is going to do nothing. But you know what? Against the Red Reserve or Kingwin, they probably have chances for an upset, especially in best of one. So Nip, I think, maybe not by a big margin, will get out of this group. I'm actually going to say it's Red Reserve that makes it. I'd love to believe Kingwin do for Taz and for that great storyline. But I think there's more quality in Red Reserve at the moment. I think they're just their land players. God said looked better. The coaching change does alarm me a little bit, but I'll say they get out. So in a world where those four teams make the playoffs, Optic left out, Nip and Red Reserve. I'm going to say the teams that make the major, as I said before, basically probably should be Optic and Nip. I give a small outside chance to Red Reserve, but it's going to take big performances. And the fact that they have some players who look a bit whack at the moment, don't really like it. I know Nip's form doesn't look good and the system looks bad, but I actually think that could mean Dennis plays better at this tournament and they have more firepower. Left out have a puncher's chance to do it. They have the fraggers. They maybe even will be able to play enough maps because some of these teams have weird and small map pools to do it. But it's going to be tough to win enough best of threes in a double limb format to get past those squads. So I'm going to say Optic's probably going to do it. Pretty decent chance. And Nip, I'm going to say somehow does it. If not, then I think left out overall. This video was kindly 
supported by Dean Tanglis, Gardner Wilson, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Alex Adams, Daniel Yordanov, TTMXMP, Vexi, Haupt, Robert Baxter, and Travis Greb, with a special thanks going out to Jerky's Minion. Want teasers for my upcoming content? To ask a question for my monthly AMA? How about taking part in a discussion with me about esports? Or perhaps you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Become a part of the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.